to give a talk at HBCSC. Uh, to give a mo to most of us, he is quite familiar because he has been the uh, senior professor and director of TIFR from 2002 to 2007, and he continues to be a distinguished professor at TIFR. His uh, educational qualification was BSc Physics Honours from Presidency College, University of Calcutta, MSc Physics from University of Delhi, and PhD Physics from Northwestern University. He has a postdoctoral, he did his postdoctoral research at the National Magnet Laboratory at MIT, and he was the James Frank Distinguished Fellow at the University of Chicago. He serves in um, various organizations and he has held many positions. Currently, uh, the latest one which he held was also the Acharya J.C. Bose Distinguished University Professor at the Presidency University, Kolkata. He is uh, also on the editorial board of the Reports on Progress in Physics, the Technology Advisory Council of, the Bri of British Petroleum and the IIT Council of the Ministry of Human Resources Development and the Council of IIT Mumbai and the mentor group of Presidency University Kolkata. He, uh, most of us uh, know Professor Shobhu Bhattacharya for, uh, for his interest beyond uh, physics also and therefore uh, the topic today is the crisis in uh, India's higher education, what is to be done. We would re uh, really love to hear his views on this topic and uh, I invite Professor Bhattacharya to give his talk. Thank you. Can you hear me? Is this working? No. How about now? Oops. How about now? Is that okay? Great. Thank you very much. And it's always a great pleasure to be here. And I realize that I haven't been here for quite a while. Um, and it's uh, great to see faces of people I have known for more than a decade, and also faces of people whom I have never seen before. And um, so this talk, I, I should begin by saying that um, this is uh, to the memory of Professor B. M. Udgaonkar, who used to all usually sit there. At most occasions, I had come. And he was one of the few people um, through whose, not directly, but through whose writings and uh, because of what I heard from him, this, uh, my subject, uh, this today's subject uh, became of uh, some interest to me and eventually has turned into a bit of, a, a, a bit of an obsession. Um, so what I'll do today, I mean, one of the great things of uh, no, longer being, um, uh, no longer being part of an institution is you can speak bluntly and, and frankly and it has no consequence. So therefore, um, uh, what I'd like to uh, tell you is what I think of it, um, but I'm an old man, so I would like to actually take you through what I'd like to call a personal story. So the, here is the story. The story is that I left India when I was about 21 years old, and I spent 30 years outside the country, and then I came back when I was 51. So you can see that most of my adult life um, was spent elsewhere. And then I came back as the head of a, 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 one of India's um, greatest uh, scientific institution. And I have to admit that I was clueless. I couldn't understand anything as to how the, uh, the institution functioned uh, or how anything, anything functioned. So if you are a physicist, you want to have a simple picture with everything fits. And this simple picture was not easy. So what I have come up with is um, if there are, sometimes there are historians in the room and they get very annoyed with uh, my version of facts. And so I'll tell you about a story, and this will be mostly stories. There was a Hungarian physicist named Leo Szilard. I don't know how many of you have heard of him. He is one of these great Hungarian physicists um, like Teller and, and von Neumann and so on. And uh, Szilard um, carried, he was most known for carried that letter from Einstein to uh, F.D. Roosevelt to get the Manhattan Project, the nuclear weapon program, started. And then, after he saw the first explosion, he was horrified. And he decided it must never be used. By the time, American military decided that he couldn't speak 
in public and put a gag order. And then he ra wrote a book and in manuscript form and the old cyclostyle form, and I've seen the cyclostyle form in the University of Chicago Library. It was not published at the time, now it is. And um, uh, the, the name of the book was um, The Facts According to Leo Zillard. And so somebody said that, Leo, why are you spending all this time writing this book? Um, nobody's going to read it. So he said, I'm writing it for God. And, um, and then people said, don't you think God knows the facts? And he said, not this version of the facts. So it is in that sense uh, you should listen to the rest of my talk, that this is a version of the facts, may not be the version of the fact, or may not even be a defensible version of the facts, but this is my facts. Okay, so here's a picture, and I normally show this picture, and I ask people to guess where this is. I showed it in Calcutta, and that tells you where it is likely to be. It is in Calcutta. And um, uh, so uh, I'll tell you, uh, you know, later more about this picture. I think this is a rather interesting picture. The, everything else that I'll tell you is, um, you know, much of the uh, inspiration for most things I'll tell you uh, comes from this great institution known as the West Canteen in TIFR. And I'll tell you pictures, quotes, anecdotes, and incorrect stories. Some of it is real, some of it is Im uh, imagined. Um, so just take it in that spirit. Don't take it very seriously. It's in the spirit of a tea table, coffee table conversation. Okay, so, um, so here is the outline. So the outline is that I'll have a preamble. I will go through a very, what I call a brief history of time. Then I'll speak about something, and I'll tell you why I'm speaking about that. It's something that has come to be known as the Bengal Renaissance. Then something I'll call a twist in the tail, then uh, everything else will follow. But because I'm talking here, I thought that I'll end this talk with some speculation. And that speculation will involve um, TIFR and Homi Bhava Center. And I'll tell you a fantastic story, which some of you know, probably very few of know, maybe two, three people I can see who know. Um, and it's true. Now. Um, what, if anything, is to be done? What is to be done is, uh, is the name of an article uh, that Lenin wrote um, during the Bolshevik Revolution. And those of us who were young enough to be in Calcutta in the 1960s, whatever Lenin wrote had to be read. So you know, we had read it. And this is the first time I'm using it for something. Now, the other thing is, is um, Joan Robinson, a very, very famous um, uh, economist in Cambridge, and she said this, that anything one can rightly say about India, its opposite is also true. So everything I tell you, its opposite could also be true. OK, so wha what's this picture? So it is a picture taken in about um, 1870s. Um, and this is a picture in Calcutta in a place called College Street. And um, those of you, uh, is there anybody here from Calcutta? OK. Um, can you recognize? Barely, right. OK, so let me orient you. Uh, it says Presidency College. Now, this man has, uh, doesn't know what Presidency College is, so I'll show you. This is Presidency College, where I went to study. This is a school called Hare School, named after David Hare. This is the Senate Hall of the University of Calcutta. This is the edges of the Sanskrit college. This is what used to be known as the Hindu school. And in between is the Sanskrit collegiate school. What is most interesting is not this. You know, you see this structure, and as you can see, that this pond, which is called College Square, that these buildings are very incongruous with this uh, uh, pond. Or won't you think so? I would think so, that this architecture and this pond doesn't belong. What really doesn't belong is these two characters. Okay? Now, politically incorrect. Now, we are going to be politically incorrect. And you can see, without my telling you, is that there is an impression that is going to be created, is that these institutions have nothing to do with these two people. Or if you want to turn it around, you say that these institutions are going to be created 
so that someday they or their children or their grandchildren will enter there. Okay. So this is part of the colonial program. So who is this man? His name is Francis Frith. This is his time. He took all these pictures and he managed to take these, you know, these are 4221, 4212, these are his plates and he has managed to misname every single thing. Okay. Hindu, uh, this uh, presidency college is actually uh, the University of Calcutta. This is called the University of Calcutta. This is presidency college. This is, he calls presidency college. This is the Sanskrit college. Hindu college is the Sanskrit college and this is the, this is the Hindu school. What it is, I, I suspect that these are very famous pictures, but uh, what it is, it, it's, you can see the plan of the imperial design of educating uh, the natives. So what one has to remember is that the beginning of what we call our higher education built not out of a desire from the inside to create a higher education program, but it was built as a program of the colonial masters to run a program. Now, it couldn't just be that. It must be must much else. But this was essentially uh, the plan. And the way I prove it is this. You see, the picture that you saw of those two characters have now been moved here. Okay, So they have been moved along one edge. So the photographer is deliberately using these two characters as a prop. Okay, and they're being moved from one side to another to another, so that he wants to ensure that when he sent them back to the Parliament of England, it is understood who it is, where it is, and you know what its likely uh, thing would be. So our beginnings were steeped in this colonial background, which, it, which is good to remember, because I think that it is kind of a hint to many of the incongruities that will hit one, it hits one later. Okay, so let me tell you very quickly, I'll go through this, and some of you have heard this talk and I apologize. Um, I'll go through these things very quickly. First is Midnight's Children. Now, why Midnight's Children? The, you know of this novel by Salman Rushdie called Midnight's Children. So this is 19, uh, this is 2017. And midnight was uh, midnight of uh, August the 15th, 1947. So what that means is this is the 70th anniversary of midnight. So what it also means is that anybody who was born on that midnight this year will no longer be a member of any academic institution in the country. Okay? So this is a changing of guard, whether we like it or not the midnight children are going to leave the scene. And I'm part of it. Okay, I'm kind of in the middle of it, but I'm part of the midnight children if you, you know, add plus or minus five years. And that matters, and we will come to the fact why it matters. Then I'll tell you about some other stories. So the first story I love very much, it's called the Leiden University story, told me by this man named John Maidosh. If he lives long enough, he will win a Nobel Prize for having discovered something called spin glasses. He told me the story, and I don't know if the story is right. I tried to find it on, on the web, but not clear that the entire version is right. But the story is so lovely, I want to tell it. So Leiden was a city state. And it was attacked by the Spanish army during the in Inquisition. You know about the Inquisition, right? The Spanish Inquisition. OK. So they attacked Leiden. And the citizens of Leiden fought very bravely and held off the army for days and weeks and suffered incredible losses, some to the battle, some to starvation, some, some to malnutrition, till the William of Orange came to their rescue, defeated the Inquisition army, and freed them, liberated them. And he said, I'll give you two choices for your bravery. You are so brave. Either you will pay no taxes, ever, ever. He really meant ever, or I build you a university. And the citizens of Leiden said, build us a university. Okay. Now, this, I think, is a very heartwarming story because I don't think there is any place on this planet where if you give the citizens this choice, this would be the outcome. But there was a notion of what a university could do 
around that period of time, which has come to be known as the in period of enlightenment. I like the story, so I just want to tell you is that this story, it helped, you know, it happened somewhere else. But during the early days of the Indian higher education university story, this was in the background. This kind of notion was in the background. Okay. Now I want to show you this, uh, this set of n uh, names that kids really liked. So when I used to come here for the Olympiad program, I don't know if I showed this list here before. Um, I'm sure none of the kids are here. Um, so in, uh, when the year 2000 came, there was a survey done, a uh, very complicated survey, of the most important 100 people of the previous 1,000 years. Okay. And I'd like to show you the top 20, because the top 20 was done by very complicated algorithm. Who are the top 20? Oops. So start from the bottom. Don't uh, look at the top. Adam Smith. The Economist, Michelangelo, the painter and the sculptor, John Locke. Here is Mahatma Gandhi. By the way, this is the only person who will show up in the hundred from outside of Europe and Western. This was obviously, you know, very Western centric. Strangely, Hitler just ranks above him. Okay, and uh, and it is because important people, you know, not good people, not uh, famous people, not. Uh, you know, richest people, not popular people, but important people. Then uh, Thomas Jefferson, Edison, Pasteur, Freud, Da Vinci, and they put it here for science, G Galilei, Galileo Galilei, Copernicus, Einstein, Marx, and so on, so on. And to my great dis uh, you know, disappointment, this man came in number two. And I couldn't have conceived of anybody uh, exceeding him, and nobody did. What happened was they gave this instrument, this machine called printing press, uh, number one, and Gutenberg got it for that. What is remarkable about this list, if you just go through this, a uh, couple of things I want to, because it will come back. Um, first of all, you notice how many of these people are scientists. Okay? There's a remarkably large number. And the people who, we, who explained it said that the last uh, 1,000 years actually belong to science. The most importantly, remember 1,000 years. So th this is not the time of Christ, not of Buddha, nor of Muhammad, none of these people. This is from you know, the previous 1,000 years. The other very, very interesting thing that I found extremely interesting, but you, you don't have to agree. You know, this, rec this will be recorded and this will be available. What you can do is you can make your own list of 20 and compare and see where you differ, where you agree, and so on, is Martin Luther. Martin Luther is not Martin Luther King, by the way. This is Martin Luther, okay? He is the Protestant Reformation, that he came up that high. Okay? And this is something to think about, and I I'll just leave it there. You can chew on this fact. Why did he come only after Newton? You know, I'm just discounting this. This is not a man. Um, this is not a human being. Newton, and then Luther. All right. So now I will show you some pictures. And I uh, like to show these pictures because this talk was entirely um, you know, uh, the result of wisdom uh, that I have gotten from many of my uh, friends and colleagues uh, during my days in TIFR. Um, and I bookended with uh, Professor M.G.K. Menon, who first actually got me actually into this program, and Arvind Kumar here, and I'm very glad he's in the audience. And these are the two bookends. I deliberately put them in these two corners, because between them, I think that most of what I uh, would like to tell you uh, I got. By, by the way, they are not responsible for my opinions. They are responsible for the knowledge they put me in it. Okay. Uh, do, uh, does everybody know who these people are? I'll just go very quickly. Uh, Govind Swaroop, T.V. Ramakrishnan, Rad Radhakrishnan, Chitre, Obed Siddiqui, Girjesh Govil, this is Mathai Joseph, Dani Raghunathan, Rajaram Nityananda, Kakotkar, Virendra Singh, Palram, and Arvind Kumar. So these are people who have given me, through their work and through their version, some ideas about 
what we now call uh, the India's education. And all of this began with a book. And this book was given to me by Professor Menon. And there's an article by him in this uh, book. And interestingly, this book's uh, cover is Nehru. And I'll come back to Nehru repeatedly. Some other people were responsible for it. Inadvertently, I wrote an article at the ur urging of this man. He's an anthropologist. He's a Bombay person from, from, um, from uh, uh, you know, he, he, he studied in Bombay. This is a historian. This is a classicist named Sheldon Pollock, whom you might know about the Murti. Uh, um, uh, he's the editor general. He's a classicist, uh, basically a scholar of Sanskrit, and the economist Amartya Sen. And what was interesting about it, which both of us felt interesting, is that he wrote an article called Crisis in the Classics, and I wrote an article about Crisis in Indian Science, and you could just read one for the other. So this was rather odd. Okay, so what do people think about universities? And I give you three quotations. Disraeli, who used to be the chief prime minister of England, said the university should be a place of light, of liberty, and of learning. So apart from the alliteration, this is a rather lofty notion of what a university ought to be. Now here is a tongue-in-cheek from uh, an upper class um, smart aleck person in Max Beerbohm. He says, I was a mo modest, good-humored boy. It is Oxford that has made me insufferable. Okay. But in the end, this is where all knowledge resides, and from Wikipedia, and it tells you in great detail the definition of, of a university. So the university can come in all these three various uh, formats. And all of them are important in how we think of the university. And I'll spend a bit of time with universities. So now let's go very quickly through modern times. And I like this quotation, the past is never dead. It is not even past, okay, by Faulkner. And um, so I'll tell you what modern times in my reading is. So I'll start with the West. I'll start with the European Renaissance, printing press, then Da Vinci, Michelangelo, Galileo, Copernicus, etc., etc. Then I put this Protestant Reformation. And this is very important. And I'll come back. Martin Luther's document. Then, of course, Newton, Dalton, Faraday, Darwin, Industrial Revolution, then steam engine, and then this absolutely amazing thing happens known as thermodynamics. Okay? And the modern age is launched in some sense. Now, if you compare this period with what happens in India, Aurangzeb dies 1707. At that point, GDP of India is 24% of the world. Now, I checked this number many, many times, and the number is 24, folks. It's not 25, it's not 23, which means there is only one source which says the number is 24 and everybody else is copying it. Okay? But roughly a quarter, the quarter of GDP of the entire planet is in India. Okay, so you have seen these pictures of Thomas Rowe at the court of Jahangir. Why is he there? 24%. That's why he's there. Okay. Then Plassey, then Bengal famine. This is where I come from. One third of the population die in a country which owns 24% of the GDP. Right. Mutiny of 1857, independence movement begins. And during independence, GDP is 3% of the world. That doesn't mean 3 and 24 is a factor of 10, roughly. Okay, so it's an order of magnitude drop. And we could have an argument as to what that 3% really means. What led to this drop from 24 to 3. OK, I, I'm just going back to uh, history of uh, the brief history of time, I told you. Now, brief history of physics. Now, this, again, I got it from internet. I don't have a separate source. And this number I found very interesting. It lists ideas of physics. And 250 BCE is Archimedes' principle. And the next idea that it lists from at least Europe is 1514 Copernicus. Okay? So that's about 2,000 years, 1700, 800, 1800 years 
there is no idea of physics that is generated from the continent of Europe. However, not true about Arabia. Arabia generated plenty. China did some, India did some, and so on. But at least what this says is the ideas don't come every five years on a five-year plan uh, that you know you make progress. A thousand years, more than thousand years go by. But what is interesting is the range. You know, then there is Copernicus, then Galileo's feather and coin, and you know this goes, and then of course this in incredible thing happens, Newton. Then, but you see the pace at which uh, the discoveries are going on. I'm not going to go through the discoveries. I stopped at the discovery of the electron at the turn of the 19th century. So this is the pace at which the modern age is beginning, that science, knowledge of science is moving as rapidly as it is. I, I had to put this in because I think this is one of the most incredible uh, feat of mankind. Um, so all of this happens. India does participate here, Jagadish Chandra Bose with Tesla and Marconi. Uh, he uh, does uh, do, he takes part in this discovery. Okay, now let's come back to politics. 15, uh, 1757 to 64 is when East India Company, um, I, you know, I go through this uh, history as if people don't know. But I have noticed that frequently younger people don't quite know this. This was drilled into us when we were young. So I can, if you, you know, put me to sleep, I can tell you these numbers. But just it's an interesting idea to go through. 1784 Asiatic Society, then Hindu College, Presidency College, was founded by Hare and Ram Mohan Rai. Wilson College is the oldest college in Bombay. Madras, Presidency College, Rudki, first co college of engineering arts and craft, then the mutiny. The year of the mutiny, the three universities are founded in Calcutta, Bombay, Madras. JJ School also starts in Bombay. Okay. The British crown on, takes control. Then a watershed event, Indian Association for the Cultivation of Science, the first research institution in the country is founded by Mahindra Lal Sarkar, a doctor, and Eugene Lafont, who is a physics professor, is a Jesuit priest, a physics professor of St. Xavier's College, whose students included Jagdish Chandra Bose. Independence movement begins, Bengal is partitioned, Tata steel. You know, these numbers, uh, these events I'm just putting in to suggest something to you. These are not, you know, very, um, it's not that they are, not, they are without a plot. I'm plotting that you will see it the way I see it. Okay. Tata steel in Bihar, 1909 Hind Swaraj is published. And IISC is founded in Bangalore. Okay. Again, I'm not suggesting they are connected. I'm just saying these are the times. So we have to remember the times. What is interesting, and this for this, enough, enough evidence exists. I have seen some of it, is that this was a result between Swami Vivekananda and Jane Tata being on the same boat going to Japan. And Vivekananda says that why don't you build a place? for science and Tata builds it, writes to him, says Swamiji, I built this. No record that he replied, but he wrote an editorial saying that these are the temples of modern India and young people should flock to these places in large numbers. The only reason I'm making a point is that these days, you know, we hear of, you know, science education somehow as a separate thing from education in all other things. What I'm just trying to say that a monk comes up with the idea that there should be a science institution. Okay, so the Nobel Prize, University College of Science, this and PC Ray. So University College of Science is basically the Dito copy of the University College London. But this is the first, uh, I'll, I'll come back to it. Then I put this, because in middle of all of this, this also happens, Jali and Wallabag massacre. Is there anybody who doesn't know what Jallianwala massacre is? Okay, all right. Then Raman, okay. a miraculous event. Statistical Institute, Mahalanobis, CSIR labs. Then very rapidly science institutions begin, very, very quickly. 
uh, TIFR, then Institute of Nuclear Physics, which is today called Saha Institute, and partition independence. At partition, 300 million people had 17 universities. Okay. So I'm just going to take you very quickly through a, a different glass, and this glass I, I'll call the Bengal Renaissance, and it begins in 1817-1829. It is due to Raja Ram Mohan Roy. This is a statue in front of Bristol Cathedral. Um, uh, by the way, uh, his house uh, is uh, nearly dilapidated in Calcutta. Okay, so this, um, all of this that I'll tell you, here is an article. This is Professor Menon's article. You can read it. When this gentleman died, do you know who he is? Yeah, anybody who doesn't know? Okay, his name is Satyajit Ray. He is a film director. Okay, he died in 1992, and the next day in Times of India, I was in Bombay at the time. Mr. Sham Benegal was asked what was his opinion. He said, well, you know, it's rather clear. Bengal Renaissance began with Raja Ram Mohan Roy. It just ended yesterday. Okay. So it was a rather stark statement. But because, you know, the starkness of the statement, I, conf you know, I conf you know, confirmed with him that he, ended, he indeed said that. He said that there was a long period, and it has ended. So that it has ended if you believe that it has ended, or at least it's in the, you know, in the final dregs are there, uh, one could look at it. And we, one could try and see if that had anything to do with what we call uh, higher education today. So I just did this uh, comparison. Okay. And this comparison is where will bring us will bring us back to Martin Luther. Now, um, uh, a general knowledge, this is who is this? Raja Ram Mohan Roy, this is? Dasagar? Yeah, okay, I won't ask. This is, uh, okay. This? Galileo. Galileo. Won't tell you, find out. Okay. This? Martin Luther. Okay, so what I tried to do a, 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 a kind of one to one. So the trouble was that that there is only one Da Vinci and there is one Vidyasagar, and it's very difficult to put somebody else. But this man, uh, his name is Erasmus. Okay. So the point I'm trying to make is that this is religious reform, which is followed by an incredible, you know, flowering that happened. Now, I'm not suggesting I'm not anti-religious. You know, please don't report me to the government. Um, all I'm suggesting is that a, a, you know, a theological control on society, one, once one is freed, good things happen. And it happened in both cases. Okay. Science institutions, Presidency College was founded by Ram Mohan Roy and his friend, is a Scotsman named David Hare. And this is a statue which still hangs there. Cultivation of science, Mahindralal Sarkar, but his friend Eugene Lafont, okay, a Jesuit priest. This is Bose Institute, Jagdish Chandra Bose and Margaret Noble, alternatively known as Sister Nivedita. These people were involved. So the story of the colonial um, uh, you know, experience is not as simple as one would think. Okay. And you know, many people point out that none of these people is an Englishman. This is a Scot, this is an Irish, and this is a, uh, you know, Belgian Jesuit. But, you know, three is a small number for statistics, so we won't go there. But nevertheless, these were the beginnings of Indian um, research and science education. What I want to do, since this is going to be in, in a recorded and presumably a PDF will exist, you can read it at your leisure. What I want to say is that if you, I, I have put in three different quotations from these three different people. And what I'd like you to understand is that there is no, until, until uh, af after independence, it will be impossible for you to find any quotation which uh, evokes any sentiment that's evoked here. Okay. 
and this is unlikely to be an uh, accident. This man says that until men learn to respect in each other's honest convictions, and until they are free from all prejudices, uh, until they are fearless of the consequences of discoveries in the fields of knowledge, fearless about the consequences of discoveries in the fields of knowledge, they cannot be said to have become civilized men. And he says knowledge comes from that. Similar thing, Rajendra Lal Mitra, an orientalist, he says that let every step of science education be explained by experiments. For science to be learnt should be learnt in the laboratory. But do not attempt to make your institution a school of technical education in industrial arts under the misnomer of practical science. Okay. This we will hear again later. And finally, I, this I find the most extraordinary statement, and this is Lafont. He is saying the agents, he is talking about Sarkar after Sarkar died. He says the agents of the colonial power wanted to transform the Hindus into a number of mechanics requiring forever European supervision. But Sarkar's object was to emancipate in the long run his countrymen from this humiliating bondage. And uh, you know, the notion that education of science leads to emancipation is an idea which was articulated at that time and I submit to you has never articulated since. Okay. This picture sends every physicist to Nirvana. Okay. This picture is called the Solvay Congress picture and everybody knows this picture. If you are a physicist you know this picture, you, it probably hangs in your office. Okay. This is 1927, a place called Solvay where everybody who was anybody gathered and a photograph was taken. Okay, I'll just you know, show you a few. The uh, front has an odd number of people, 11, which means there's a center. Okay. And the center is this person. Right? I'm just making it up, folks. Okay? I'm just thinking that it was not an accident. They said, Herr Einstein, this is your place. And he sat there. And you can see that he's happy sitting there. Madame Curie, in the back, the young Turks. This is Heisenberg, Pauli, Schrodinger, Compton, Dirac, Bohr, everybody. Okay? I showed this in TIFR. I asked, is there anybody who has not seen this picture? Nobody raised his hand. So I said, has, how many of you have seen this picture? Not one hand went up. You have seen it. Great. Okay. Very good. Does anybody know who these people are? You have seen it. So you don't count. Can you guess? Okay. It's roughly the same time. Okay. So these are dhoti clad people. So you can guess these are Bengalis. Uh, this is Jagdish Chandra Bose. This is Meghnath Saha. Satendranath Bose. D.M. Bose who nearly discovered the pion. Just missed it by a Glitch had a student, a woman named Bibha Chaudhuri, who later worked in TIFR. This is J.C. Ghosh, the first principal of IIT Kharagpur, the first IIT. And at the same time, not in this picture, in the city, a Raman and Krishna. Okay. So there are 29 people here, there are six people here okay, who could easily be there. So again, you know, it comes back to give you this weird notion of 25-4 percent. Okay. So this is, uh, you know, 6 out of 29. And I can easily place these people there and take some of them out. Right. This gentleman named Fowler had two very famous Indian students. One is Homi Baba, the other is Subramaniam Chandrasekhar. And Fowler became famous by working on the extension of the Saha ionization equation. Okay. So these people were there. And where were they? They were here in this one city. It's a British city. We have to remember that it's a British city. And this is where all the colleges are, Presidency College, Medical College, Sanskrit College, University of Calcutta. The picture I showed you, cultivation is there, St. Xavier's College is there, Ram Mohan Roy's residence the University College of Science, both institute next to each other, Vivekananda's home, Thakurbadi, Tagore's home. 
And very interestingly, recently the flyover at the corner of Vivekananda Road and Ravindra Sarani collapsed. You know? Okay. I won't, I just let it go. Okay. So, what is, a, a, in, this is Bhagavad Street in 1928, and this is where Raman discovers Raman effect. And I don't know if you have read um, G. Venkat Raman's book called Discovery um, uh, Journey into Light. If you haven't, please read it, even if you're not a physicist. He has tons of physics. He has a little book, but I would like you to read the big book. You don't have to read everything. Just read about 20 pages around the discovery. And I just want to say that it is an extraordinary account because it comes from Krishnan's diary. Krishnan kept a diary. Krishnan, you know, was Raman's student uh, when the discovery was made. Please, please read it. I'll come back to this. This is other, if, if anybody uh, interest, is interested, this is Chandrasekhar's book. This is a book on Chandrasekhar where he says, he calls all of this, the entire thing, a miracle. He says, the advancement in physics gave a false picture that making discoveries is easy. Then he says, you know, then he says that, but going to England was a shattering experience. This is Chandrasekhar talking. Why is he saying this? You may, in your off time, mull over it. What, is, what does he mean? Now, I just want to, I don't want to go too far. I just want to say a little bit about this man. His name is Ashutosh Mukherjee. Uh, have you heard of this man? Yeah? OK. So he was a jurist and a mathematician. And he gave up both to become the vice chancellor of Calcutta University. And what he did was he created the first research university in the country. And there is no evidence that he had gone to America to find the American model. So today, if you describe this model of the university, you are, call, you are told that it's an American model. Nobody tells you it's a Mukherjee model. Okay. What he did was he did many things. You know, he started, post, he decided, remember, Indian universities were only conducting um, examinations. No teaching, no research, nothing, just conducting examination. Calcutta University had colleges from Lahore to Rangoon under its uh, own wing. So it just conducted exams. He changed all this. He, uh, you know, got applied psychology, industrial chemistry, Ind ancient Indian history, anthropology, whatever. Pali, Sanskrit, Bengali, Hindi, all sorts of things. And he was one of the first people to recognize Ramanujan. He hired a few people. He recruited P.C. Ray. He went to Maharajas and rich people to give them endowment, lectures. He got Ray as the first Pali professor of chemistry, Raman is the first Pali professor of physics. When he didn't find a good, um, good uh, philosopher, he went to Tamil Nadu to get Sarapalli Radhakrishnan. Then he also got Bhandarkar's son Bhandarkar to become uh, the head of uh, history and anthropology. So he built a pan-Indian national university and even got Jewish emigrates to run away from England, from uh, you know the you know the looming clouds of Nazism to come to India. So this was all done. So you know there are all sorts of things he had done. His classmates included Prabhula Chandra Ray and Narendra Nath Datta, who later becomes Swami Vivekananda, and he did lots and lots of different things. Okay. I'll forget the personal. Now, here is something I don't like to say very much. It's there for you to read. There is a book by a man named Robert Anderson, who spent a lot of time in TIFR. He's a Canadian. He has written a book on Baba and Saha as two persons who tried to build institutions in India in two different ways. And the story he tells is a very sad one. Andre Weil one of the great mathematicians of the last century came to Aligarh to run away from Nazi Germany. 
uh, Max Born uh, went to Indian Institute of Science to run away from Nazi Germany. Uh, there, are, there are things written about it. And what it tells you is that these great people, these great scientists, did not like one another and went at each other with a vengeance, with vengeance. And they were enemies of each other. And I do not have an understanding, except I can tell you that this happened. And this is to great detriment of the country that these towering figures could not get along. And we have, we have this country has three academies. One is Krishnan's, one is um, Raman's, one is Sahas. Okay? And even today we have it, because they didn't get along. And this is a period which uh, are greatly uh, stated in Bond Rutherford letters, which are available. You can read them. I won't read them. It makes me very unhappy to read them. You can read them. It just says how these people just, just undercut each other. And what we had ended up at independence is something uh, very, very different. And this previous great period were essentially undercut by a tribal warfare within the ranks of the great scientists who could not manage a good governance. So we can get into this. One man who wrote wonderfully about this is J.B.S. Haldane. He left England, came to India. He hated the imperialist policies, and he decided he would come to India, lived in Calcutta, died there. He has written a lot of things. And the other thing that has been written by is John Maddox, which some of you will remember, was the very famous editor of the magazine Nature. And he, you know, these were people who expected, based on this miraculous period of India, to India to burst open in this world of science as you know, nobody's business, and will just leapfrog everybody. And that didn't happen. Okay. So, so this is the twist in the tale, that education serving an empire to education serving a nation are different. And this difference was not managed very well in our country. So I'll go, show, I'll go fast. I just want to show you a couple of pictures and to give you a sense of where we stand today in our education. So these are. You know, I've taken a bunch of people in various combination. Nehru with Tagore, Nehru with uh, Bose. This is Gandhi with Bose, Nehru with Gandhi, Bose with Tagore, all combinations. Okay? These two people were, without a doubt, the two most important people in modern Indian politics. And they did not always get along. I'm imagining that here they're getting along, and here they're not. And they have entirely different idea of what India's future should look like. You have all seen this picture, right? What do you think this is? Anybody know the name? As soon as I tell you the name, you'll say, oh, yeah. Can you see the similarity? It's called the spinning jenny. This begins the Industrial Revolution okay, in Manchester. Okay, and this is a cotton mill. Okay. And you can see that uh, you can see two things. One, this is a formidable opponent for a charkha. It also tells you why the charkha is a symbol. Okay. So both are there in, in this. Uh, this so, uh, so this remains in the background of Indian education post-independence, particularly in the mind of the only man who survived Indian independence, really. Gandhi dies 30th of January 1948. It's left to Nehru. And Nehru basically crafts everything that we today know as Indian science policy. One man. And I, what I'll do is I, I'm just giving you a story. I think that you know, I'm just suggesting to you that once I began to read this story, it is 
you cannot stop reading it. You want to read more and more and more. I'm just giving you glimpses of sources that I found extraordinary. I hope you do too. And if you read what um, Nehru writes in jail, when he is in jail, he writes and he says, the future belongs to science and those who make friends with science. 1946, in the British jail. He writes a science policy resolution of 1958, goes to the parliament. Please read it. It's in uh, DST uh, website. Please read it. It's two pages. I can guarantee you that you have never read a better argued uh, document on why a poor country should do no science. It wasn't obvious. But he, he wanted. He didn't want. He remembered what Indian Industrial Revolution did. And that's what, uh, that was the driving force. So these are pictures, you know, this is famous pictures of Nehru at TIFR. These are the three men that we often like to show. What we don't often like to show is this tallish gentleman. This is who recently passed away, K. Chandrasekharan, who built the TIFR School of Mathematics. Okay, so I call these the men who would be king. Okay. So post-Indian independent science was run by Bhatnagar, Bhaba, Raman, Sarabhai, Mahalanabis. And you won't see a single university represented here. Okay. So post-Indian independence is a policy that India's progress must happen through specially created universe institutes, which is as far possi as possible from students. Okay. Now, I'm sure nobody said that it has to be as far away from students, but this is in effect they did. Okay. And this, I think, is the crux of, uh, I, I like this series of things. So, Baba is without a doubt an incredibly, incredibly bright man, had amazingly good understanding of building institutions, was a great scientist. He says, long range research would appear in general best carried out to universities, special institutes attached to the universities. Its development and trend should be entirely unhampered by any thought of immediate utility. And this is exactly what uh, Rajendra Lal Mitra says about 100 years ago. But look what he says afterwards. He talks about building TIFR. He says, creating close ties between teaching and research is the right way to progress. But such a program would need a very widespread vision of our university system in India, where research facilities are inadequate and the staff overburdened with teaching duty. 44. By the time, so he says that it will be very good, TIFR will be very good to the university. By 1960, he has given up. He has indeed given up. And everything that you read of his in 1960, he doesn't think the university is workable. Okay. So in universities, people tend to stagnate. In science, stagnation should be avoided at all costs. So what has happened by the mid-1960s, where well, remember, this is the time when an extraordinary expansion of research universities is happening in the West, most in, importantly in the United States. And it is this time that India abandons universities, literally. Humanities also is abandoned, not much funding, because it was not part of the Industrial Revolution, was not going to be part of emancipation. Whatever money there was went to institutes, like where people like me work. So, so I would like to say to you is, uh, you know, this, this is just more of it, that is, what is the policy? The policy is a trickle-down policy, that India has a li little bit of money, and this money should go where it makes a difference. If you give it to everybody, you will get nowhere. So give it to the institutes, support them as well as you can, and from there it will trickle down. But what doesn't happen, and we can talk about this, is um, India is a very peculiar society. It's a caste society. 
and the caste imposes its will on the institutions, not the other way around. Okay. And therefore, my judgment is that the institutes, the supported institutes, did not think of themselves as part of the overall academic structure, including the colleges and the universities. They were at the towers where the Brahmins sat and everybody bowed. Okay. This is, at, you know, at my old age, this is what I think has resulted in the peculiar situation that we find ourselves in. That as soon as we get on the airplane, we go to university. Once we are back in this country, we won't step inside the university. And this is true of our students. Okay. All right, so there are these documents you can read that it gets worse and worse and worse and eventually becomes unreadable. This is magnificent, this is not so bad, this is quite awful, and this is just unreadable. Okay. So, uh, so what has happened is all of this, this bureaucracy, is now handed over to bureaucrats, written not by visionaries, by committees. Committees have to put in everything to satisfy every lobby. And so a total bureaucratization, deflowering of the greatness that had happened during a time when we were colonies. Okay. So this is a worrisome thing. If you look at uh, this, INSA in 2010 got about 30, 40 of our best scientists and asked them to write a report. And this is the INSA report. And what it says is that our uh, science is in very bad state. And it says everything quite correctly. Okay. Although what it doesn't say what it doesn't say is how intricately connected the activity of research and teaching are. And the whole world knows it. And why is it that we still do not know it? Okay. Now, the creation of the ISAs is probably a step in the right direction. But there, too, we won't go all the way. We will say science, but you know you will study science, but you should not know any history because it will take you away from that part of your brain that will go in learning history, or literature, or philosophy, or political science. So you must do science and engineering. This hangover of the Industrial Revolution, that having missed the Industrial Revolution, still, still is very, very deep in our psyche. And our uh, education people still haven't understood what the rest of the world has known for at least 400, 500 years, that you best thing happens in the universities. So the, these are people in the vision group. You read who these people are, and they are not trivial people. These are the best and brightest of our young people. And I call them young because they are much younger than I am, but they are you know, getting up there. They are in the late 40s, early 50s. And you know, I look at it, I said, well, you know, this is the future of the country. And if this is their judgment, then we old guys should worry. What are we leaving them behind with? Here is more things that I want to say. Nehru says this in Indian Science Congress in 47, that science must think in terms of a few million persons in India. In 2012, Manmohan Singh says in the Centenary of Indian Science Congress, I submit to this august audience that our government has invested as never before in Indian science. For many years, the capacities in our higher scientific and technical infrastructure were stagnant. We built world-class institutions that created islands of excellence, that created new knowledge, but we did not use science and technology in our development processes as much as we should have. By the way, I mean, we have kept a division between science and technology. But what it says is that you know, it, it's an indictment of what we have achieved. Okay. You might say, well, you know, prime ministers, what do they know? But prime ministers don't give speeches lightly. Lots of people help them write something. So what is to be done? So I go back to Lenin's question, what is to be done? So you know, many things happened. Many things happened in between. Other wars happened. Politics changed ex-colonies to become client states. Underdeveloped change to calling developing as if by just changing the name you change their status. 
we got into games of names and words and so on. I, I have my own opinions, we can go. So uh, there are two quick things. One is I went to a meeting in Delhi where the minister says that 9% of high school graduates go to college. Next 10 years, the number will be 20%. So we will beat 1,000 universities. So I couldn't take it anymore. As a physicist, I said that means two universities per week. Then everybody laughs. Next year, I'm out of the committee. Um, but the point I'm making here is that these are not serious statements. This is not understanding what our problems are. Okay. This is just random things that we, people are saying. So here is my Chaturvarna. You know, this is our caste structure of universities, uh, institutes. What I think the main problem is our governance structure is Western, but our governance culture is Swadeshi. So we have done this Nehru um, Gandhi thing. Nehru's uh, modern and Gandhi's Swadeshi was put in the worst combination possible, and we are working that out. Low emphasis on humanities because they are not useful somehow. Okay. All right. So uh, I'll just skip all of this. So I, I just have, you know, I decided to make up uh, some morals, you know. Can one think of Ashutosh Mukherjee models of universities? Excellence is not an enemy of access. This is what you hear all the time. Elitism without exclusion has some virtues. Perfection is an enemy of progress. This we are perfect at. We will, as soon as I tell you something, you will tell me why mine is perfect, is not perfect which absolves you of doing anything at all. Okay. Flexibility is not an enemy of rigor. Okay. And again, back, that the service of an empire is not the same as the service of a nation. Okay. So, you know, I thought since I'm coming here in uh, HBCSC, I'll just end by saying this. Is perhaps this is for you to think about. Supposing, supposing, uh, because I tried do this experiment long time ago. Those of you with longer memory may remember what happened with that thought. Is suppose you wanted to do, uh, redo a TIFR today. What would it look like? Would it look like what it looks like? If we could do an HBCSE today, what would it look like? Just the way it looks like? Okay. So what I, I'm not going to say everything uh, that should be a you know, discussion. But I thought that what I'll do today, I'm going over my time, is that, um, you know, what about a university? Okay. Is a university such a, is a thing that we will not consider? Why won't we do universities? Why are universities in our country doomed to be bad? unlike universities elsewhere, would you even think of it? And so I, uh, you know, in the abstract, I promised that I will, uh, you know, talk extensively about, um, you know, what one might do with a TIFR and a Homi Bhava Center today, if you were there. I'll just say one thing, that I had said this here, in this room, when I first came here. That when I look at, as an outsider, and I was a rank outsider, if I look at TIFR as an outsider, and I'll say what part of TIFR will never, ever, under any circumstance, not any, I can think of some circumstance, hope those circumstances don't come, what part of TIFR is the most solid part of TIFR that nobody will question is the Homi Bhava and today somebody was telling me that you don't have you know, easy access to getting faculty. And this is an extraordinary thing if you think what the needs of the country is. Okay. And um, you know, I just throw it out to, for you to think. You know, is there a formulation possible of a new system in a new era, in a new millennium, 
where the organizational structure of the entire system is different, that you create a center not vertically, but horizontally, and at the center of that horizontal structure in a TI system is the Homivada center. Okay. So, I will end there. Sorry I went over. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Bhattacharya, for a very comprehensive uh, uh, and historical background to this entire uh, educational scenario in the country. Um, we will now take some questions, after which we will have tea outside. So, if there are any questions. It seems to me you are putting the entire thing, pro all the problems of Indian education system to, to this basic organizational problem, you know. The fact that universities were neglected and centers. I, my personal feeling it is only a small part of the problem. Because there is this, you know, we keep on ma making these statements that India has islands of excellence and then say the universities are not very good, etc. And I have never found anyone, including in your talk also, that anybody questioning that are they really islands of excellence? Uh, we, have, we have been just taken taken this statement for granted for as long as I have remembered I have heard this that these yeah. are islands and then the other thing is very unremarkable and the actually uh, uh, these so called islands of excellence to my mind are really not islands of excellence correct islands uh, uh -huh. islands though. you will agree they are islands yeah yeah they are isolated from other that part is all right but uh, so no, this connected to my point that it's it's not that they remain isolated and excellent and it and the others got neglected and the universities got doomed to what whatever state they are right now. There's something basic, uh, basic to the you know, what it is only a what is it called a cultural anthropologist or somebody can tell. I would not be able to okay. articulate it, but there is something different because even if these things are getting, you know, corrected a little bit, ICERs, etc., and TIFR also has become a university. So these points have been recognized for a long time, and some small efforts have been done to take care of them. But I, I don't think they seem to, they re don't really address the real cultural problem of. The, the something about it, so, I mean, what was it in Bengal Renaissance? And was it just an exception, and or, or, um, um, uh, or is something deeper in in Indian so culture that that doesn't let us go to excellence, at least as far as science is concerned? Okay, so uh, and there are several yeah. several uh, yeah. questions. Um, See, in an hour, I don't think I could uh, tell you all problems of Indian education. And if you say that there are others, I would not disagree. What I wanted to get across is this is mostly higher education. I'm not talking about primary, secondary education problem either. What I'm trying to focus on is something where I can get my head around a conflict between a group of people acting rather differently in two different epochs of time. Okay. Now, islands of excellence is a relative statement. And this islands of excellence uh, by world standards are not excellent, as you know very well. Right? The islands of excellence, as somebody was, uh, there is an article which will appear in EPW where somebody points out that, um, you know, Rajaram Nityananda is very fond of saying it, and you must have heard, 
is that uh, the four things that you readily come to mind after three things that can readily come to mind after independence is um, uh, Ramachandran plot, um, Rajodhuri equation, um, uh, what's the third one? And they are all done in universities. Chandra, perhaps, or did he into a? Yeah, so uh, he moved to IISC after uh, okay. Ramachandran plot mm -hmm. and Collagen. But these are again statistics of small numbers. What I'm trying to get at is not that this is be all and end all of Indian um, uh, you know, education. Uh, I'm also not claiming that I know everything everybody has ever said in the past. And whether mine is a you know, completely novel idea of where India's education problems start. What I'm suggesting to you, if you ask me what is one central thing missing between the Renaissance and now, I think the missing thing is an absence of a national project. There was independence. And the freedom movement had created, in some sense, a, a, a force, an inspiration, whose of you know, that kind has never come back. What has happened is business as usual after independence. So if you look at articles, and I even, you know, I, my generation has seen people like Raj Choudhury. If you listen to and read what um, these people had written, you know, they're not looking after the next fellowship of an academy, the next nod from Delhi. Their ambitions are far, far greater. And this notion of an emancipation is a very broad idea. So these great things that happened in a very poor, riot-torn, terribly, terribly devastated country, went from 24% to 3%, um, is a peculiar combination of not abandoning a structure that's foreign, not internalizing institutions that were built to run, a, uh, run an empire and insisting that our governance culture will be Sadeshi. And the basic conflict of these two modes of a structure that's different from the culture is in my mind one of the key difficulties of you know, this is the first thing that struck me when I came here, that my first early years of difficulty rose from the fact that I did not understand that although dean is a dean and a director is a director, they operate in different universes than the ones I knew of. So this is just one person's view. And I'm not suggesting that you buy what I'm saying as the rule. But uh, it, it, there should be many options. And if you look at my abstract, you know, I'm just saying that my, what I'm telling you is that there should not be holy cows. We still have too many holy cows. And uh, you know, Raman was a great physicist. So was Saha. That doesn't mean what they did later in life with respect to each other is to be worshipped and glorified. They didn't. What they did was quite awful. And uh, you know, in our culture, that uh, you know, Newton was a terrible fellow, right? We all know, and the Brits know too. So, anyway, I mean, I I, I think I have some partial. I completely agree that this is not your whole story. This is my story, as I told you. Hello, sir. Uh, I have some questions to ask you because when you just started your lecture, you saw, you saw, you just projected some pictures of Presidency College and in early 80s, uh, 100 and etc. So I want to ask you that uh, you were projecting these pictures only to describe uh, the education system of that time according to the Europeans' view, or otherwise you want to, uh, you know, to show us the so the pictures. Uh, the, at that time that uh, India's education system go to the eventually low and uh, after many years of glorified... Oh, no. then, then I have completely failed. Okay. 
So let me see uh, where did I, uh, what did I want to say. Um, what I wanted to show you is that if you are a student of architecture, you will recognize immediately those architectures have no parallel in Indian architecture. These architectures are European architecture. In, in the city of Mumbai, if you go to uh, the old Prince of Wales Museum, you will see a different kind of architecture, which was a mixture of kind of Mughal and European called Indo-Sarsenic. But these, um, these things, oh, it's gone. Um, so the architecture in these pictures, Fritz picture, you just go to internet and just type Francis Fritz, you will get these pictures. So these pictures, um, you know, the uh, Hindu college, beginning of Hindu college had something to do with uh, um, uh, the, uh, so you see there were, um, uh, there is a huge amount of literature and in a, uh, in a five minutes I cannot tell you all this, you know, I, this takes a lifetime for people to study such things. Um, these uh, photographs, I think um, in my mind, you know, where in India have you seen anything like this? No, Only this here. was British architecture. Yeah, so every so. single thing is. Every single thing is. So what I'm saying is that, um, you know, if this were to be in Padua or, uh, you know, I, I don't know, Cambridge, they will be of their time, of their culture, of their people. Yeah. Here, the, you know, uh, I, I mean, there is, there is very good literature about how photography, early photography of uh, 19th century India was a very important political tool by the British East India Company to keep convincing the British government to let them continue to run India. And these were their good deeds. You know, these two people don't look like, you and I will agree, put poli you know, political correctness aside, exactly. is that they are incongruous with respect to the building, right? So you can look upon this as two different kind of political purpose. One is that they have no business being there, but someday some offspring might. And the other, look, up, look at this. In this vast, you know, people, uh, large people, miserable people, we are bringing ideals of Socrates and Plato and Aristotle and Shakespeare and all that. So what I'm trying to say here is a little, I'm being a bit quarrelsome. I'm just saying that um, these beginnings uh, were not a wholesome development of India. India is also a highly, highly caste-based system. And if you look at the initial student population of these institutions, they were mostly upper caste people. And so, you know, I mean, British ruled India not by themselves, but by active collaboration of the people who bought into all of this. Okay. And my worry is that if you talk to people who live in the Northeast, uh, and if you, you know, if they trust you, they will tell you little has changed. Okay, sir, again, so I, I, th it is in that sense. So I didn't mean, I just meant you to look at it as a matter of irony. Uh, in the previous days, I was talking with uh, my roommate, and uh, and he used to say that uh, the the British has o done all the things that was appropriate for India to spread the education uh, in the times of early 80s and 90s and etc. But I, I I was telling him that no, they had done nothing. Uh, so do you think that if British has done anything in order to spread the modern education in India? In uh, the for for the only purpose the, and for the sake of education and proper education uh, like uh, establishing uh, universities and etc. Because uh, I know that they had all done it for their own purposes only in order no, to no, educate some uh, people no, no, I, to I be some clerk and to do no, their no, own I, jobs. Okay, okay. I, I, I'm I'm sorry. I, truth lies somewhere in between, as usual, right? I mean, it's uh, not that. See. Um, uh, 
it's a it's a very long answer to your uh, question. Uh, my straight answer is please don't make uh, absolutely you know extreme judgment. Okay, I mean it is because of the British we have a railroad. Now they, you say they did it for a bad reason, but you know if you start wondering about motivation of people for having done good things, then good things uh, don't have much value either. So it is certainly not true that the British did nothing good for India. But the point is, you know, we don't live history over again. History happens once, and we can't say where India would be if the British didn't come. Modern education suddenly came to India because of the British. We were not so extraordinarily, you know, I mean, modern in some sense. Why did we miss this 24% to 3%, OK? One version of it is that the British exploited us so much that we went for 20% to 3%. Another factor, you know, like Professor Arvind Kumar was saying, that simple-minded extrapolations are likely to be wrong, is one major part was that the United States had joined industrial production in the post-industrial revolution. So they became a huge, huge player, which they were not in during Aurangzeb's time. So the answers are not so simple, but the answers that still contain key of truth. And what I was trying to get at is one of our difficulties even today. You know, I now work at a university and I see undergraduates. Undergraduates come to study something which have usually rather little to do with what they want to do. It has a lot to do with their neighbor wants to do, parents want to do, you know, uh, grand, grand uncle wants to do, and so on and so forth. So this tells you that this education is not an internalized system. It is still an attempt to say what will give me a job rather than what will give me fulfillment. So nobody is saying that I'll be emancipated by my education. I don't hear the word emancipation even conceived of in the discussion about a career. Right? You know, I saw this, I told somebody, I saw this in New York subway. Somebody said, never do anything you don't like because you don't like it, you will be no good at it. Uh, in India, it will be do something that you, will, uh, you are no good at it because it will get you a good job. You know? So I'm saying that to say that this is a culture, then you know we have nothing to say, okay? Then we are doomed to this. I'm saying that perhaps there is a reason for this culture. And this culture is the disjunction between the origin of our modern education system and an internalized cultural evolution. Now, the great people during, uh, um, during Renaissance, were they not great people? They were. And these events, these great events in history, bring up the great people because it's a time of tumult. But my, you know, I come back to this question that Professor Arvind Kumar has correctly pointed out. What is the big difference? And I think we have not had a cause in the country since independence. There is no great cause. And perhaps we need causes to rise. I don't know. That's just a thing. Do we need kind of uh, Protestant reformation? Because the way you showed it, I mean, the equivalent of that, I mean, we probably thought that the freedom movement would be equivalent of that. But I think Protestant reformation went beyond that. In a certain sense, it brought in a cultural revolution in which science grew in the... Say that, in say that one more time. I didn't I, quite get the it. The Protestant revolution. Oh, the protest. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. OK. I think they really... See, they change uh, Europe culturally. Absolutely. And, and Protestant that, the revolution. equivalent of that doesn't happen in Indian history. Yes, yeah, so the Brahma Samaj was in some sense, at least if you grow up in Bengal. Now, um, Arun Grover, whom you both, you and I know, is now the champion of this Brahma Samaj uh, business. He has learned in Punjab uh, that uh, Brahma Samaji influence went very far to Punjab. Uh, Bhatnagar uh, was, a, uh, was a Brahma Samaj. I didn't know that. So Brahma Samaj, if you like, um, is, uh, is a reform movement. OK? 
Okay. During Ramon Roy's time, it was very much like Christianity. Because you know, these are very bright people who have been, I mean, imagine you are 18 year old and you were running into Newton and you have never known that. You know, what is your thinking? You know, it has to be a huge shock to your system that somebody tells you that, you know, things here do the same way as things up there. It's just one law, you know must be an extraordinary experience. So these people are trying to come to, I'm imagining, grips with this extraordinary phenomenon, uh, learning things that they didn't know. Not because they were stupid, but just because they didn't know. So Protestant revolution, I think, was, it seems to me, is the forerunner of Renaissance. That Renaissance needed getting out of the clams of the Vatican. You know, you know what Gali happened to Galileo, right? I mean, here is a man which says, you know, Earth goes around the sun and they put him in jail and nearly lynched him or killed him. Eventually, he, would say, he said, sorry, sorry, I'm wrong, and they, they let him live. So a similar, and I don't want to become politically explosive, I would say that these uh, civilizations which have not had good reform movement need to have them. And it is, uh, it is in that sense the Protestant Revolution was very, very essential. Because it, it wasn't till much later, you know, after the Italian Renaissance, for example, most of the development in science and technology came out of England, Germany, Netherlands, non-Catholic countries. You know, and the, uh, and the Europeans still, you know, if they are comfortable with you, say that that is still true. I don't know. Fermi was not a, Fermi was <laughs> not a, <laughs> not a thing. Yeah, no, I think Protestant Revolution was a, an extremely large event. And um, we, um, the, the, I mean, when uh, the Brahma Samaj thing, I had a very long conversation with, um, uh, with um, Sham Benegal over his comment about this end of Bengal Renaissance. And he points out that, you know, he has thought this through and he thinks that this really is a change. That, uh, that you know, this man was the last person you could call a Renaissance figure. And since him, there is none. And, uh, you know, whether, you know, you take it, maybe there is one other who died three years later. But it's rather clear there isn't anybody whom you call a Renaissance figure now. Right. So I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm a great believer of the Protestant Revolution, Protestant Reformation being a major event, major event. Although you remember that Newton also in his Principia had to make sure that the thing happened to Galileo didn't happen to him. So he was very clever and, and devious, in fact, uh, trying to uh, stay on the right side of the church. But, uh, but these are, you know, these are things we should chat about, over and think about and argue and disagree. So. Sure. Any other question? Are there any other questions? Or we will chat over it over tea. Ah, yes, Thank you. that's best. Thank you. Thank you.